This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. And we're back for another fireside chat on a week where the Flames split their possible points. And it was uh, an interesting journey for the Flames. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, what did you think of this week? Well, the Flames are looking like they're slowly falling off the face of the earth again. And uh, their play this week has not exactly inspired a lot of confidence. I mean, we got excited as Flames fans when this team started to get some wins, when they started to string them together and we got into a playoff spot. But I think we all knew going into the season, and even you and I said, this team has holes. Like, this is not a Stanley Cup contending team. We're not the, the Blue Jackets. We're not, you know, any of these great teams in the league. So to me, I think we're really at the halfway point, really kind of seeing the Flames for what they are now. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that the team is still dealing with the fact that they're having problems with their depth, but we knew that before the season started. Like, if you're penciling in a guy like Versteeg and Chason in your top nine, your team's not very good, and we're seeing that. Like, we're in the middle of the standings. I think we're... uh, 13th or 14th overall in the NHL so it is what it is the team's doing okay but not great and I think that as the season progresses they will more or less be in that same like 12 to 18 mark in the standings and whether the Flames make the playoffs or not who knows I think this year the team really has to I don't want to say screw up, but the team would really have to let things go to not make the playoffs just because of the weak division that we're in. Well, uh, I'm going to have to disagree with you there. Just due to the fact that uh, the wild card spots, like we have some of the other good teams from the central division who aren't performing as well. Uh, like say Dallas, who was great last year, they've been at, like with Klingberg not playing well this year, the teams struggled significantly. So, but that too can change on a dime. So yeah, I guess I'm just kind of looking at. That. I think Edmonton's gonna fall. I think I I honestly don't. You don't. I think I think they're gonna get enough of a losing streak that we can tie them or beat them barely for the third pacific spot it's one of those hard things because like you, you got to figure that los angeles once quick comes back like as good as uh, of a job as peter budai has done to this point they're gonna step it up yeah cause... but i'm not hearing anything about quick being back anytime soon so i think it might be too a little too late by the time he comes back yeah it's just that when you have uh, four teams that are within five points of you it makes your positioning a little precarious. That's all. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, we don't expect this team to be a playoff team. Neither of us did at the beginning, so I think that if well, they... Well, I d- did, but you didn't. That's but true. we were both, like, on the, the either side of That's the coin kind of, okay, from so where that, we are. So, so let right me clarify now. that. Neither of us thought this team was going to be a, you know, a deep playoff team. No, we were basically... You thought they'd be just out. I thought they'd basically be a wild card team. So yeah. it was either side of that line you know probably five points or six points separating our expectations so so you know if they go out let's just say they don't make it i don't think there's a huge amount of disappointment if they do make it they get blown out in the first there's not a huge amount of disappointment no and realistically if the flames end up picking in the top 10 again that's not the end of the world either so you know, because, like, look at last year with Kachuk. Like, yeah, the year was disappointing, but we got a good player that's going to be a foundational piece. And while this draft isn't nearly as good, if you're picking in the top 12 or so this year, you should be able to get a decent player. For sure. Well, Matt, let's look at the uh, week that was for the Calgary Flames. We were talking about some of the good teams in the West, and the Flames start out the week 
playing, I would say, arguably the best team in the West. They're second in the Pacific Division right now. Not best in the standings, but when I look at their play, I'd say they're the best in the West with the San Jose Sharks, who are at the Dome. Uh, Calgary won this one, and neither of us was, I don't think, really expecting that. Uh, neither of us picked it in our predictions. Well, but, I don't think either one of us expected to be facing Dell instead of Jones. No, so. that's true. But even if we were, I, yeah, no, I probably would. I, I might have said a win there, if, uh, you know, because anytime you're getting a backup, you have a slightly better chance at it. You know, and this is one of those teams that I didn't even know who their backup was. Like when you've got the good starter, you know, it's like the Patrick Waz and that sort of, and the Martin Brodeurs. You never know who the backup is. So Craig Billington. <laughs> Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, uh, Fred Brathway backed up Cujo in Edmonton for a while. Nobody knew him at the time. Yeah. Um, but anyway, looking at this game, I thought this was an interesting game for the Flames. I knew when I was talking to some of the media guys ahead of the game, and I said, we're going to get one of two things happening. We're going to get the Calgary Flames at the top of their game, which we've seen, and they're going to make this a game. Or we're going to get the Calgary Flames team that we've seen showing up somewhat recently in games like the Winnipeg game, and they're going to get walked all over. I didn't think there was really much of a middle ground on this one. No, and this team has been playing that stark difference for the larger portion of a month, really. Like, either they're going in whole hog and can, like, steamroll a team, like, say, when they beat Anaheim 8-3 back at the beginning of December, or other games where it's like, uh, are you guys in the NHL? So, it... it there does not seem to be a lot of middle ground lately. No, there doesn't. Um, looking back at this game, I think that if you look at the first period, the Flames really did a good job to establish their presence. There were times the Sharks tried to walk all over them. They didn't let them. Um, the Flames really kind of, I thought, did a good job keeping keeping themselves in the game. They had good zone entries. They gave them some, some good shots on goal. And I was a little bit disappointed in that period when Froelich took a penalty because it's like you cannot give this Sharks team a man advantage. But then he came back and he scored to even it up a minute later. So, you know, yeah. all, all wasn't lost. But uh, the biggest thing that I was impressed by is how the Flames limited their time in the box. They kept this game mostly five on five. Both teams had six penalty minutes. And I think that if we would have got carried away taking the penalties we've seen in some games, this could have easily gotten away from the team. Yeah, and the Flames' penalty kill has been significantly improved since the beginning of the season, but still, you don't want to give up too many opportunities because they will come back to bite you. Yeah, it, they sure will. And it's, you know, you've got to limit those opportunities against the good teams. There's certain teams where, okay, you've got a little bit more leniency if you screw up, but a team like the Sharks, if you make a mistake, they're going to take advantage. Now, the thing that doesn't make any sense to me is how San Jose can have that many high-end players, and yet their power play is just average. It's like, uh, what? <laughs> Maybe they need uh, Paul Gerard and uh, Dave Cameron. True. Just, uh, it's always confounds me. Like, even, like, when the Flames had a Ginla, like, the Flames' power play was always just okay. And it just doesn't seem to correlate when you have players of that caliber. You should be not necessarily like top five, but like top 10. One cause... thing I've noticed sometimes is the teams that have a really strong, and we saw this a few years with Chicago and I think a year with Pittsburgh where their power plays weren't where we expect them to be. When you have this strong top six, like the Sharks do, I think the, the idea is just throw your top guys out there. And often those guys are tired because they've already played the most minutes. And I yeah, think that I can you know, see that. I, I think that your power play, if you look at good power plays, yeah, they've got one or two top guys, but you've got that third line guy or that fourth line guy who's on it too. And um, you know, I think that that really helps to even things out. Yeah, I can see that. And sort a good of like how like the Flames power play has Verstig on it, even though he's more of a third liner. Yeah, and I think if you look at a good power play team, they're using both power play lines really well. And we're seeing the Flames do that this year. And if I look at the power play time for the San Jose Sharks, I mean, Pavelski, Marlowe, Thornton, they all had almost two full minutes. Couture, two minutes. And then you've got guys like Ward, um, LeBlanc, and Bodker at 48 seconds. So they're heavily reliant on that first power play unit. Yeah, and 
like we've seen in the past with shift charts like once you get past 30 seconds like your play drops off entirely so especially with a power play you're skating more naturally to try and find openings so for sure it, it makes things a little more difficult if you're keeping the same guys out there for over a minute yeah it does um, I don't necessarily want to get into the Goudreau thing in this game unless you want to talk about it. Nah. Um, but overall, great game. I'm glad to see Dougie Hamilton got the winner. I was sitting up in the media box, and we're all sitting there thinking, okay, it's going to go to overtime, and the Hamilton goal was fantastic. And then the last second save to keep this one out of overtime, I was I was biting my nails the whole time. And it, we haven't had a lot of that kind of hockey this year, so it's nice to have those nail biters. Yeah, well... Usually, like, most of the games, especially lately, have been against teams that are already, like, trying to figure out which of the top three or four guys they're going to be drafting. So, it there's not a lot of intensity, but you have a playoff team in San Jose. We're trying to get into the playoffs. There's that natural intensity, especially because the fact that there is a good chance that if the Flames do make it, they might end up playing San Jose in round one so there's that extra degree of competition there uh the next game that we saw on the week was the calgary flames playing against not really an arch nemesis but a team that has a couple of former flames notably camillary in the new jersey devils the new jersey devils have had a bit of a drought here they haven't won in calgary since 2007 and they changed that this time getting a 2-1 win over the flames I think in this one, when I was watching it, it looked to me like the Devils kind of surprised the Flames early. I thought that they had a really speedy forecheck, um, and they they had good good pressure, especially in the offensive zone and the neutral zone early, and I think that it sort of left the Flames flat-footed. Yeah, well, New Jersey, by and large this season, they get out to early leads, and then they just try to sit on it like the Devils of old, and... Like, especially in the second and third period, Calgary kind of kept forcing the play. It's just Kincaid performed admirably as a, the backup. I'm actually surprised that uh, he's been, his stats are as good on the road. I think it, it, heading into that game, his road stats, he had like a 940 save percentage. Um, but when you have Schneider in that, it's not like the guy's going to be getting too many starts anyway. No, but I mean, when you've got a save percentage like that, he's the kind of guy who you know when Schneider's not in, he can come in and, you know, relieve him well. Yeah. So that we never had during the Kipper era. No, and good on him for getting the win. For sure. It's just unfortunate for Calgary that I think they were caught off guard because you look at where New Jersey is in the standings and it's like, okay, yeah, we can beat these guys because, you know, it's New Jersey. They're at the bottom. Who cares? And I think, uh, and the San Jose game was pretty physical too. And I think the Flames were maybe thinking they could come in and play a different style of game as well. Yeah. And I think they might have been looking ahead to the next day's game against Edmonton and champing at the bit for that one instead. And we're in danger of overlooking the Devils, and they kind of did. And it happens. As much as Kincaid looked good, I really thought that it was Johnson that kept the Flames in this, especially in the first period. I thought of probably the first eight shots the Devils took, they sh- could have scored on four of them. Yeah, And Johnson worked really hard to keep the Flames in the game, and he did a great job of it. But I think, you know, looking at the whole game, not just the first, I think that the Flames, and maybe you're right about looking ahead to Edmonton, but they just they couldn't get their forecheck going. They lost most of the battles for loose pucks. It was a sloppy effort. I would say this might have been the worst first period that we've seen the Flames play. All year, easily. Yeah, I don't want to say all year because the first Edmonton game was a pretty big disaster, but pretty close, like in re- yeah. as long as I can remember. Yeah, well, like if you're going all the way back to the first game of the season, it's yeah, it, it's either the worst or the second worst. So, but I mean, that is a regular season game this season. Oh, I know, but um, just uh, terrible effort, regardless, and. They did bounce back with a goal in the middle frame, but it, it, they just that didn't seem to have that extra gear at any point. 
On the positive sides on this one, I thought that Troy Brower looked good coming back from his injury. I noticed him. You and I have talked about some of the issues with Troy Brower and not putting enough out there. And I thought I noticed Troy Brower in this one for good reasons. He was well positioned a lot of times. He was doing the things he needed to do. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? There seems to be this thing that guys get hurt in the flames and they come back and they tear it up. Remember that happened with Goudreau? Yeah. So maybe Brower will be the same. Who knows? And I, I, was, I just know that like some people's expectations for Brower seem to be overinflated. Like the guy has always been in that thirty-five to forty-five point range his entire career, and like I think with the contract he signed, like I think team pl- people were thinking that he was going to be like a fifty-point player or something. And I think it's partly the contract and partly also that I mean, if you look at the roster, he was signed to be the first line right winger. And when the expectation was kind of Goudreau, Monaghan, Brower, I think that just kind of naturally people settled their mind on that. Yeah, but I think that's unfair to him as well. So I agree. Because like right now he's basically on pace for his usual career output of about 35 points. So like not counting the injury, like if he, he had played the full 82 games. So it is what it is. Like... I think that with the Flames signing him, fans should have been expecting basically a good second, third line forward, not a first liner. And he's, I mean, he's the same mold in that way as as for Leak. Yeah, exactly. You and know, great veteran. I don't want to say depth guy, but depth guy, middle six guy. I think that this year. Brower's maybe been thrust in the limelight because we don't have that top line right wing. But if we can find that, I think that people will settle down when he's, you know, a second, third line guy. Precisely. And, like, if you imagine, like, say in the offseason the Flames sign TJ Oshie because they will have the cap to do so, then your first three lines, you've got Oshie, you got Brower, you got Frill Leak. Like, that's a really good top nine right wingers selection. So then, like, the rest of the lineup is a little bit more balanced. Then you just need a second, third line right left winger to put with Bennett, and you've got, like, your entire top nine being quality forwards. So it's just that's part of the reason why the Flames are in that middle ground, though, because they are missing two higher quality players and can't do anything about it until either the deadline or next year. Well, yeah, and we'll, we'll get some more into the deadline when we're done our recap today. Um, another good thing, though, is Monaghan finally broke a drought, an 11-game goal drought that he needed to break, I think, going forward. I mean, we're looking at this guy to be a top scorer. Yeah, and Monaghan usually starts slow anyway, and, like, the last 30 games of the, each of the last couple of seasons, he's been on a tear right through, like, nearly a point per game at the last part of the season so like it, i wouldn't be shocked if he's on or very close to his pace from last year and he just seems to be one of those guys like a Ginla where he starts slow and finishes strong yeah no i i think it could be right there he's starting slower and i think that going forward He's going to need line mates that can start quickly to offset that. You know, like I think that if he's starting slow, you can't have him on a line and Goudreau on a line and all of them starting slowly. I think you need other guys that are going to start early. Yeah, last year after 46 games, he had 29 points. This year he has 25. So, you know, like it's not that far off, all things considered. Yeah. No, for sure. Not much else to say about this game, I don't think. Anything else you want to talk about with the the no. Devils game? I think the big story of the week is the Battle of Alberta. And we saw, you and I were confused early on that we played two games against Edmonton so quickly, and I think the Flames really started the season off wrong with those games. They got embarrassed by the Oilers, who shouldn't have embarrassed them, and it really got us off on the wrong foot. And this, to me, this game was not so much a test like the San Jose game was, but it was redemption. It was that chance to come back and redeem ourselves. And I don't think, looking at this game, the Flames could have played a better game. Talbot was just really good. Yeah, I 
thought that the team was flat for the first 40 minutes and played a little better in the third period and was terrible in the overtime and the shootout. It, you know, it, you have to credit Edmonton. They played a decent game, and they didn't really surrender too many scoring chances. The Flames just had a hard time breaking through into the middle of the ice where they usually get their goals from. And uh, Flames were also the, uh, tired. They're on a back-to-back. -back. Yeah, and when you've got that and a goalie that's playing well, it happens where you're going to only score a goal and lose the game. And one of the few times that they actually did break into the middle, Monaghan scored his goal. They've just been... The, the whole team seems to have a little bit of a problem generating offense lately. Like, since the Colorado game, really. They've just been kind of sluggish in terms of getting chances from the, that home plate area in front of the net. And, like, if you're boxing out the team defensively and just allowing perimeter shots... The goalies are, it doesn't matter which goalie you're facing, you're going to stop most of those. I so. think we're trying to compensate with that. I noticed the Flames defense doing a good job jumping up into the rush in this one. I think maybe they're trying to compensate for some of that. Yeah, it's just the, for whatever reason, none of the lines seem to be clicking the last handful of games. And... Like, even when they got shut out by Winnipeg, like, they weren't, they didn't generate many offensive chances. It just seems like everybody's timing's off. Like, even the Frolik line is kind of ebbing a bit. Yeah, but we've seen that all season, right? The ebb and the flow, and I think now we're in an ebb. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And with the Flames having uh, four Eastern opponents coming up in the next six games to end the month... It makes things a little easier just because you're facing teams that aren't necessarily familiar with you, and perhaps they can have an easier time of breaking through their defense, but we'll see. We'll see. A um, few more thoughts I had on the Edmonton game. I think that it was nice to finally have a Battle of Alberta mean something. Yeah, they had that on CBC where, like, the last time that the two teams were in the playoffs at this point or later was back in 2006 when Chris Pronger was still on the team. So, yeah, it's been a while since Edmonton has actually been relevant. And good for them. You know, I still don't think their team's going anywhere anytime soon. Like, yeah, they have McDavid and Dreisaitl and Talbot, but, man, Nugent Hopkins and Everly, wow, those are two bad contracts. And, like, I honestly, they're so bad that I don't even know if you could trade them. That's how bad. You know, I think that it's nice to see Edmonton on the upswing. I mean, we like to take pot shots to the others, but I'm glad they're finally making some headway. I think they're going to be a... Um, they're going to be a team that I think will probably make the playoffs as much as I think they, they're they going to fall a bit and we might overtake them realistly. They're going to make the playoffs, but I don't think they go far. And I think it's, no. like, it's wetting their whistle. Like, yeah, like especially if they phase Anaheim or San Jose in round one, I think that's going to be like a five, maybe six game series. And that's if Talbot stands on his head. So I don't see them going very far. And like, like there's only so far much that one player can do. Like we've seen teams in the past like where they have that one star player like Tavares in New York and if you don't surround them with anybody they're not going anywhere and yeah. while Maroon's having a good season Lucic is just okay Nugent Hopkins and Eberly are doing terribly for themselves so like it they don't have the depth to do a proper job at competing for a cup. Now that can change. Like they can, if uh, Puyu Yarvi develops properly, and they can shed some of that cap and assign it to actual players that can play, then maybe in a couple of years Edmonton may be an actual contending team. But that's a lot of ifs and maybes. 
I think Edmonton's on the upswing. I don't think they're going back down to where they were from here. No. I just think that it's I think that if you look at it, the real rebuild starts last year. I mean, Chirelli came in, he's a good hockey mind, he figured out what they need to do. I think this is year two, and I think it's a four or five year process too, like you said, bring in the right guys, surround them with the right guys. Yep. And it's going to take a while. Like, at least, like, with Calgary, uh, their bad contracts are all gone after next season. And even then, it's only Lance Boma that I'd consider a bad contract due to Stajan redeeming himself this year. So... Yeah, I don't know. I still... I think Stajan had a good year, but if you look at the entirety of the contract, it's been a bad one. Yeah, I agree, but... It's no longer a boat anchor contract where you're just stuck with it. Like, I, I think that if the Flames wanted to, they could trade him at the deadline and there would be somebody that would actually want to acquire him. So, we'll see. yeah. We'll see. I think the expansion draft might change that desire to give up an asset for a guy you might lose. True. Um, but anyway, a few things that, a uh, few more things that I wanted. Do you know when the last time we played in a shootout here was? Like, I saw that shootout in Edmonton. It's like, wow, I can't remember the last Flame shootout. I know it's been a while. It's... Oh, here. Uh, I know the last time we played in overtime was, I think, December 2nd. Yeah, so that was the last shootout. Okay, and that's nice, too, because it's not like we've seen in the past where this team has needed the extra time in order to get the job done. And, you know, I thought that it was nice we didn't hear. Um the yeah, we've Flames? only actually that was only our third shootout. We had one on in the third game of the season, uh, one in uh, that December game and the Oilers game. So, which that's good too. Like I don't like the shootout. So the fact that we've we're forty six games in, we've only had three. That's good. Yeah, and I think that's a sign of a, a team that can get things done too. Not saying again we're going to make the playoffs or go deep, but. We're able to get things done in regulation, and you're not hinging on. I mean, a couple of years ago, I remember we were always going to the overtime of the shootout, and we we're giving away points to teams that we had to keep at bay. Yeah, and you know, part of there's the flip side of that of like the Flames. I think only have three loser points this year. Yeah, and, and we've seen what was it, a couple of years ago. I think it was the Predators who made it into the playoffs because they kept getting loser points. Yeah, and like two or three years ago. Yeah, like if you look at Anaheim, they have nine, and they only have an eight-point lead on us. So, like the actual difference is only two points. If the Flames had an equal number of uh, overtime points, and we'd be tied with Edmonton instead of four points back. So, it's frustrating, but not much you can do. So. Looking at that overtime, I think that the Flames played the better overtime period. I thought they had better control, but we yeah. we got lucky on some of the shots. Yeah, like, there was a few like shots they, the showed. Oilers. Yeah, the Oilers had all of the chances. I think like the Flames had some decent possession at times, but like I don't think they really tested Talbot in the the overtime at all, where Elliot was standing on his head, especially that one right at the end. No, I, for sure, and I was so surprised they didn't score on that. Yeah. But I'm think... actually, the one positive that I'm taking out of that game is what a game by Brian Elliott. Yeah, for sure, and I think this is really the game when you see Brian Elliott play the way that we need Brian Elliott to play. Like, if this Brian Elliott can show up more often, he's going to be renewed as a starting goalie. Yeah. Yeah. And it would be nice, like, especially with Johnson playing well against New Jersey. Like, if you can have both guys throwing out decent performances, then, like, you're not having to worry about, oh, the goalie's going to give up five goals just because I'm playing him. So it's a positive. It's just hopefully the that's a first sign of good things to come instead of a one and done. Yeah, no, I I totally agree there, and I think that I think this is probably the best Flames performance we've had from Elliot, and I think part of that might be he was trying to redeem himself for the earlier games in Edmonton, but I think that you know it, this is hopefully he's a late starter this year, and this is going to be him turning it around and not just a flash in the pan. 
Well. So after this game, the Flames now sit at 49 points. The Oilers have the third spot in the Pacific Division of 53. And the Los Angeles Kings are at 48 points uh, right behind us for the wild card. Flames have two games in hand on the Los Angeles Kings. And on most teams, they have at least one game uh, in the Western Conference wild card race. So we have a little bit of padding there, but this streak has got to turn itself around. we got to start stringing some more wins together. Yeah, like if the Flames, say, lose four of the six games to end the month, I think the Flames will be, like, down in 13th. Yeah, I think you're very right. I mean, there's some teams struggling right now. Uh, Winnipeg struggling. We got the Avalanche struggling. We got the Coyotes struggling. But I think the Flames could Twelfth. dig themselves in, yeah, dig themselves into a hole. It's going to be hard to get out of if they don't start stringing together some wins. Yeah, and it's frustrating. But uh, like this team, like especially like if you look at the Eastern Conference standings, like all of those teams are somewhat competitive and if the flames go on a protracted losing streak of any kind like we could find the the flames in the position to pick in the top five again like that's how like as good as the flames have been in terms of standings that can turn around really quickly especially in a league that's so tight i mean we saw that last year and we're seeing that this year i think that the parody that everyone's talked about in the nhl is finally starting to arrive and well, like it's it- a- yeah, like if you look at uh, our standings, we have 49 points. The worst team in the East has 42, and they have four games in hand on us. <laughs> so, yeah, but I mean, even in the West, I mean, you know, you look at the viable contenders, if you will. We've got Nashville at 47, Vancouver at 46, Dallas at 44, and Winnipeg at 44. So really only two teams are out of it. Yeah, so like the in Flames the could, like, yeah, like if the Flames started to have problems that they could sink like a rock right down to the bottom is what i'm yeah so like they have to not have like three or four or five game losing streak right now well let's look ahead a little bit in the season we know that right now the flames are in the first wild card spot if they're out of the playoffs at the trade deadline in march i think that there's no doubt that we sell if you know, even if we're a couple spots out, I think that at that point you sell the assets you can and you move on. What do you think, though, Matt? If we're in, let's say we're in a playoff spot, we're in one of the wild card spots, or just outside by say three or four points, do you think the Calgary Flames should become a, a buyer, or do you think they hold the line and either try to sell at that point or just stand pat? Honestly, if the Flames are not in first, second, or third in the Pacific Division, sell. Even if they're in a wild card spot, sell. The reason being is that the players that you're going to sell are guys that are depth players mostly. Your Lance Bomas, Matt Stajan if you can, even Versteeg possibly, Weidman, Elliot maybe. So like all of those guys, uh, like with Johnson playing well, you can get by with him. Like the Flames will only have 18 games following the deadline. So like you can get by with him, say starting 13 and say uh, Gilly's starting five. So with that, the step down to guys that would be coming up to take their spots. Like if you say replace Lance Boma with Hunter Carrick, are you going to notice much of a difference? No. And you can go through the list. You're not going to be seeing that much of a difference in terms of the overall play of the players. So, like, when you're getting back assets, that you're better able to spend them at the draft. So, like, say if you get a third for Matt Stajan, because centers always tend to get slightly more inflated returns and say you can get this quality player for a second round pick well the fact that you have two thirds you can probably swing it where okay well we're gonna get a slightly inferior prospect but we're gonna still get a good player out of it so you can it just frees up other options at the deadline or at the draft the expected return of the players does that outweigh going with the younger prospect in his place 
And if the value of the younger player outstrips the asset that you're getting back, then obviously you don't do it. But in most of the cases, like if you replace Dennis Weidman with Brett Kulak, yeah, that's a step down. But if you're getting a second round pick or another good prospect in the deal, then you're like, well, yeah, you're stepping down, but the asset that you're get getting back is more valuable than that difference. So I think all in all, it just, it largely depends, but I think that even if the Flames are in a playoff spot, that it would make more sense to sell even if they're in the spot and are being competitive. Like, you can do both things. It's sort of like a couple of years ago when the Flames traded Curtis Glencross. Like, he was still a, a good player for the team, but getting the draft pick that they got for him it allowed them the flexibility to go out and get Dougie Hamilton at the draft. And I think and, that... And that's the key is you got to know when to sell a guy. I mean, arguably, we waited too long to sell a Ginlow. We waited too long to sell Bo Meester. And since you have to make those hard decisions, when do we sell someone of value? Yeah. And, like, yeah, if you sold any of those guys that are the likely targets to sell, it is going to negatively impact the team's overall talent because they're there in the lineup because they're the best players that we have. But, but I think in some ways you need to make room too, especially if we're at that point at the end of the season where let's say we're just outside the wild card. We really need to see what do we actually have in a guy like Poirier or a guy like Jankowski, and that's going to make room to try them out. Yeah, or Shillington or Anderson. Like You wouldn't play them for all 18 games, but you'd give them a cup of coffee just to see what you have there and make them hungry for the next season so that way when they come into training camp they know what they have to do in order to earn a spot from the get-go looking back at previous deadlines we usually buy something yeah you know i mean last year we bought a, an old broken goalie but we're usually buying something and i think that this year it's going to be a tough year to be a buyer because i think everybody is going to be trying to I think everyone's going to be trying to buy, and I think that it's going to overvalue whatever you try to bring in. I mean, the only teams that are really out of it right now are Colorado and Arizona. Yeah. And they both have some good pieces, and I think there's going to be bidding wars for those. So I think we might be able to get a higher value than we usually would. Well, look at what we got for Chris Russell last year. Exactly. And I think this year is going to be more of a buyer's market. Yeah. And like, that's why I'm looking at Dennis Whiteman, and yeah, he's okay. Or sorry, but... a seller's market. Yeah, but the, you look at the fact that scoring defensemen, which he is one, are always at a premium. The Flames just happen to have three guys that have dynamite slap shots between Giordano, Hamilton, and Weidman. So we have that redundancy, and that's part of the reasons why his numbers are deflated a bit, because he's not getting the same power play time. But you got to figure that there are plenty of teams that they just don't have that particular tool in their toolbox. So they're going to pay for it. And I think there's also teams, and I was talking about this actually, it's funny you bring it up. I was talking about this on Twitter this week um, as our at Fireside Podcast account. And the question came up who would pay for Weidman? And I think that, like you're saying, he's a veteran scoring defenseman. Yeah, he's overpaid, but by the deadline, that's going to be negligible. And I was talking about this with Ryan Swanson uh, at 76 Swanson on Twitter. And to me, I think a team like Tampa Bay might take them because they don't have a lot of defensive depth. And if you're going to the playoffs, I'd rather rely on a veteran guy than an AHL guy. Yeah. And realistically, to a team that's contending, what's a late second round pick? Like, what are you going to get for the 55th overall pick? Yeah, say? I don't think we get that much. Well, you probably could. I don't think anybody would have expected a second-round pick plus two good prospects for Russell. So, you know, it, you could possibly get something of that caliber, especially, like, if there's only three or four defensemen, period, on the market like there was last year. So, you know, if you're a good team that needs that extra oomph from your back end, like, even a team like Chicago, they don't have that bomb from the point outside of Keith and Seabrook. So, they might be interested in somebody like that. So, 
Yeah, I think any team that's going to look at Weidman as an impact player in the playoffs is kidding themselves. But I think that he becomes well, that. Well, it would be he would basically be your five six guy that you just stick out on the power play just for a slap shot. And that's like when he was with Washington, that's basically what he became in the playoffs for them. So I yeah, think... I, I think it's also that yeah, and and a guy that you're right five six, but also can step up to three four if you are screwed. Abs- yeah. Like, if you absolutely need it, he can fill in in a pinch. Like, there, when the Flames made the playoffs, he was on the top pairing with Russell. So, you know, like, he can do it. It's just that, like, it, with that experience, teams will value that. Especially, like, even a team like Columbus, who is so young, like, they might want that veteran leadership, and because of their high abundance of quality prospects they might be willing to ditch a decent pick just to get that veteran guy in there i always look at can we get better than what we paid and if you remember on june 27th 2012 the calgary flames and washington capitals made the deal that brought weidman here we gave up a third round uh 2013 fifth round pick which i'm not even sure what that became and And jordan Jordan Henry. And Jordan Henry. Yeah. So to me, there's no doubt we get a return on our investment. Oh, yeah. And R- Weidman, by and large, has been worth his contract. So, you know, the last year he wasn't, but this yeah. year he's a little overpaid, but not by much. So, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you on this one. I think if the Flames aren't in the top three Pacific spots, I don't say gut it and tank. I hate people who say oh they should just strip no strip the parts but it, and tank. you you listen to a, a handful of extra names like if say somebody really wants for steak for some reason maybe you go ahead with that it whereas like you're not actively saying oh we want to get rid of them yeah but you might look at it because hey you know if somebody wants to offer me a good prospect or a good uh pick for him can we get away with not having him in the lineup probably so you know and, like and i i always laugh at teams who you know they're on the bubble they don't make the moves they need to make and then they lose a bunch of great assets to ufa and they have nothing to show for it and i don't yeah. want to be that team not no this year. and especially because the flames are still technically in a rebuild even though like we're coming out of it it's just it's not quite there yet so you still have to have a little bit of that mindset. And especially if you look at the drafts that the Flames have been having lately, like, you look at the players that we got last year, like, wow, you know. So, you know, if you get more of those picks, you can find more of those players. And guys like Dubé, Parsons, Fox, they're all good players. So... Yeah, I don't want to insinuate that, you know, we're going to make these trades, bring these players in, and they're going to be a cure for us. You're no. going to struggle. Oh, and no. we know that when you make those trades, but we need to see what we have there. We need to see going forward, what do these players look like? I mean, do we give up on some of these guys? Do we move some of them next year for assets? Yeah, if you well, look- like, it, say, like, the Flames decide to trade Versteeg, just because, why not? Well, you could always just bring up Jankowski and move Bennett over to the wing, and kind of see like how each of them is playing in relation to that. So that way you're not really losing the wing talent type of thing by shifting Bennett over there. And you're getting to try out Jankowski with some offensive players instead yeah. of just on the fourth line. So it, there's some flexibility to be able to see what each of those guys have. You know, I mean, I'm hearing people who are saying, oh, we should go shopping from the uh, the Coyotes. We should go shopping from the Avalanche. But everybody's going to want those players. Yeah, and like, I'd like Landis Cog. I'd like Deshane. I'd like but so Hansel. Does, but, but so yeah. is everybody else. And I think the deals yeah. are going to get crazy for those guys. And I, as much as I like those guys, I don't want to pay the price. No, like, I'd rather uh, wait I, the few months and then go sign TJ Oshi to a $6.5 million a year contract and not have to actually spend any assets to get him outside of the cash. I mean, if we were first in the Pacific Division, yeah, I would go shopping oh, for, for a sure. right winger at the deadline. If we were second in the Pacific Division, I'd shop for a right winger at the deadline. But right now, I think the cost of bringing that player in is just too much. It's going to gut this team and set the rebuild back a couple of years. 
Yeah, like uh, honestly, I'd rather just wait and back up the Brinks truck for Alsner and Oshi uh, at the UFA day. Uh, we don't they, have much of a Brinks truck to back up, my friend. Well, we do. The cap. Yeah, yeah we'll I get... know, but you're going to see a bunch of cap get removed. And, That's true. Yeah, you, know, you could always throw $11 million at the two of them and just sign Johnson for relatively cheap, like, say, two and a half, three million dollars $3 bring Gillies up, and, we'll see. you know, you could do that. Like, it, yep. it financially, it would work. Yeah, so. it would. I, I don't – I think this team has been – I mean, we've seen them throw a lot of money at a single player in the off season arguably maybe too much and i think they might be hesitant to do that again yeah but i think that they're gonna want to try and reallocate some of the higher cap so-so players to higher cap good players so for sure you we'll just see. yeah you just don't want to get stuck with too many yeah oh high for sure cap numbers yeah that's the whole balancing act but you know the flames are gonna need to be in that contender mode soon and the only way to do that is to get legit talent. Neither you got to trade for it or sign it, so or draft it. Yeah, and I just I just don't see the point of overpaying at the deadline for assets that we don't really need right now. I'm fine no. if we don't make the playoffs this year. I would rather be the seller and have somebody overpay for our assets. I mean, do you remember the year we traded Red Obara for a second and we were all laughing? Yeah. Patrick Wall really wanted the kids, so maybe we make a deal like that, or like you said, the uh, you know the Chris Russell deal last year, and we got some good assets. Like I think that if we can have one more year as being uh, a seller, I don't want to say a wholesale seller, but we have some pieces to move. I think it's going to help this team long term, and I think being a buyer at deadline prices is going to hinder this team. And even if we just make a swap for a swap, like you remember when we traded uh, Marcus Granlin f- or was it was it Berchi for Shin Carrick? It was uh, Granlund. Granlund? Okay. Granlund for Shin Carrick. Like, even a deal like that that's just a hockey move that moves different guys in and out, I'd be fine with something like that, too. Yeah. I know. And good for both Berchi and Granlund for taking the reins and actually succeeding in Vancouver. I don't think they would have gotten that kind of opportunity in Calgary, so good on them for earning I, contracts yeah i don't think they're franchise guys going forward but no. i think in this weird in place rebuild if you will that vancouver's trying to do i think they kind of fit in there now yeah decent we'll middle sixers yeah and uh, you know hopefully they keep the team good enough so they can't quite rebuild properly so they just kind of toil in that well now that edmonton's good somebody's got to be bad right yeah keep them just good enough where they can't get a top pick but bad enough that they don't make the playoffs for mm-hmm. like the next five ten years <laughs> that would be nice i don't think it'll happen but that'd be nice yeah so matt you want to talk about the uh deadline stuff we just talked about i had a topic i wanted to get, pick your brain on this week okay so goudreau monahan last year the two of them tore it up we saw these guys going into the season we saw this as the duo of the future This year, Gullitson has broken them up for the most part. We're seeing them playing with different guys. We're seeing them playing on different lines. I guess my first question to you is, do you think that's the way it needs to be going forward, or do you think that this is temporary? My thought on it is I think we're moving them around because we need to get some offense there. But I think once these guys turn it on, and if you look at the four, five, six years in the future, this is our number one pairing. But what do you think? I'm not going to agree with you there. I no? think that, like, you look at Chicago, and Taze and Kane played there for the first handful of years, and they were successful. But as the team's moving forward, they needed to spread the wealth around a bit, and especially, like, as they were shedding depth, they needed to have guys on separate lines that could generate offense. And, like, yeah, while Gaudreau and Monaghan, it would be... Obviously, it's always better to have your best players playing with your best players. The Flames are really lacking two top nine forwards at the moment. And, like, Versteeg is kind of questionable, and Chason is not. But that's why I think this makes sense this year. But I think that, I mean, this isn't a solution for eight years down the road. I think you have to build that middle line. Well, that's the thing. Like, if you play Gaudreau with Bennett, it it gives 
it just depends. Like, it, it, you have to see how a guy like Bennett will respond, because Monaghan can carry his own line and mm -hmm. by himself, and he has shown that this year. He showed that in his first year. So, like, if you put two decent players with Monaghan, that will be a decent line. It might not necessarily be a superstar caliber offensive line, but it'll be a good line. If you can get Gaudreau and Bennett playing, like, at the level that Gaudreau and Monaghan were the last two years, then, like, now you've got three really dynamite lines, and now it's just, you can just start attacking in waves after wave after wave and just absolutely massacre the opposition. That's part of the problem, though, when you're lacking two high-end top nine forwards, though, is that you're uh, kind of forcing mediocrity onto each of those lines, and as a defense, you can key in on the two good players on each of those lines, which it, when Monaghan's by himself, he's with Brower. So you key on those guys, and you key in on Bennett and Gaudreau, and you can kind of just ignore the the third guy in each of those cases. So I don't disagree with you that you know you definitely need two top lines. I'm just wondering if you know, and we've admitted this team has things that it needs to work on. Yeah, you know, and I think that if I look at it, I would rather put Monahan Gaudreau as one and have a powerhouse number one. Put Kachuk for a leak and backland line is three, and then build a second line. Yeah, and I think that it's just it's hard when you don't have the horsepower at the moment. Like, at the moment, uh, but but going like forward, I, one I think of those that's... things that I'd like to try is uh, having Bennett actually line up on the right wing and stick him with Gaudreau and Monahan, and see if that might click. But again, I think that's almost too much firepower on one line. Yeah. The Flames are kind of stuck in the middle right now. Where yeah, and I'm not necessarily looking at this year. I'm looking at oh, you know, no. two, three years down the road. I know. Uh, that's where it's a little hard to pigeonhole exactly what everything's going to be. Because, like, the Flames, if they miss the playoffs, they could end up winning the lottery, and then we got Nolan Patrick on the first line, and problem solved, <laughs> you know, for that. So... It, I guess the, the it, reason it, I, the reason I bring it up, Matt, is I'm looking at it going, okay, you know, Kachuk came in, we found instant chemistry. Yeah. We found chemistry we didn't expect him to have with Michael Backlund, with Froelich. Well, actually, I'm going to disagree on that particular point, because when Kachuk was with Bennett and Brower, that line was awesome. And it was when Kachuk was struggling a little bit, he got dropped the line, and then so I think Kachuk has actually been part of the driving force on either line he's been on. Okay. I'm but actually we've also, thinking but we've like, also seen Kachuk yeah. mixed around with Monahan and Goudreau earlier too. Yeah. I don't know. Like a, yeah. I think, I think to me, the thing with Kachuk is both those lines you mentioned, he had good veteran support. True. And yeah, it's, Really so, tough when you don't have enough cards in your hand to mm -hmm. play a proper game. Like, you know, it's like trying to play poker with three cards in your hand. You just don't have enough cards. <laughs> so, but, but even before they put um, before they put Kachuk on the Bennett, or sorry, the backland fro leak line, line, those two were starting to get chemistry by themselves anyways. Oh, yeah. So I guess where I'm going with this is I think long-term, Goudreau Monahan becomes your one-two. You find them a winger, maybe it's Oshi, maybe it's Nolan Patrick, maybe it's somebody we pay for. But I think that becomes your solid number one line. I think that you leave, if I were the coach looking, kind of projecting two, three years out, I think it's Kachuk, um, Froelich, and hopefully they re-sign Backlund, and that becomes kind of your third line. Now what I see is I have Bennett, who I need to be on the second line, probably as a left winger, but I don't know who to put him with, is... Brower, the right partner going forward, is you know somebody else the right partner. I'm I'm kind of wondering if we're going to end up with what I call the Iggy problem, where we've and we know that that Gulletson likes to have pairs. We know that he tried the you know Monahan Goudreau pair. He tried the Backland Froelich pair. I'm just wondering who becomes the mate to the second line to that left wing or center young star or is this a the Iggy problem where every year we're trying to bounce somebody new to find chemistry uh, with Bennett well that's the 
like why I thought that Gaudreau and Bennett make sense because of the fact that Monahan seems to have chemistry with Brower. So like it's one of those situations where do you find a good left winger for Monahan and then find a good right winger for Bennett and Gaudreau? You know what I mean? Like it's <sighs> Yeah, I think it, to you me know the, what I mean. Like it's kind of hard because of the fact that you don't know exactly what options are available to you. Because, like, say, like we're both interested in getting T.J. Oshie, but he might not want to come to Canada at all. So, you know, like we can want that player, but he might not be available. And the only thing that is available is a left winger. So, if anyone's gonna find a way, Matt, it's gonna be Brad Trilling. True. It's just it's one of those situations where it's hard to but i don't think we need to go out and get the pinnacle win winger either i mean i think no. one of the things we've seen the flames do well over the last couple of years is develop you know guys who might be in someone's middle six to be top six or yeah you know, like we need top like three basically like two decent actual second line forwards like i yeah. don't think we need a star player i think we just need two decent second line guys because we I have agree. enough star talent as is it's just that we're lacking like what hoodler was like a couple years ago because he was one of those decent second line talents. yeah we need someone who's who's a second line talent i think someone who's a second line talent because they have more talent on that team yeah. you know and i always looked at hoodler that way is that was a very deep detroit team he could be a first line or anywhere but we got a discount because he was a he was a second line forward yeah um, but you, you know, you might be right going forward. I guess I'm just looking at Bennett as not being disciplined enough right now to be, I guess that guy with Goudreau and I find he's not fast enough to play with Goudreau a lot of the time. They have chemistry, but he's just not keeping up all the time. Yeah. One so, player that I would like the flames to go out and get is Gustav Nyquist from Detroit. Cause Detroit's doing terribly. I think he would be one of those good second line ish guys. Yeah, I have a feeling Holland might overvalue him. Yeah, but they're kind of going into a rebuild themselves, so... Yeah, but it's going to be tough to take a guy like that and not have to give up a piece to a rebuilding team. Yeah, oh, I know. Like it, it depends on where the Flames finish, too. Like yeah. If the, they're in the playoffs, then you probably would be willing to drop your first on a player like that, but... Maybe. You know I guess, how it is. Like, yeah, it, I guess that was just something I wanted to bring up because I was thinking about that um, on my way home from the San Jose game that I really think going forward, we're going to have Bennett and I think we're going to be perpetually looking for wingers for him. Um, let's assume he's going to play left wing because I think that's where he'll slot in. I think we're going to need a center and a winger for him. And I just don't want to see a lot of big contracts like a Brower contract over the long term trying to find a guy to fit with him. And then we're back to having a bunch of you know overpaid players. I understand. So that's that's my thought. We'll see what happens over the next few years. But I was curious on your thoughts on that. And you could be right. It could end up being, you know, Goudreau and, and Bennett. I just think then you need, especially on the Monaghan line, I'm not sure Monaghan's the sniper you need. I think my, Monaghan's going to end up being more of a playmaker. So I think then you got to find another sniper as well. Yeah, well, I think that's the key exactly for what this team needs is guys that can snipe the puck. And... Like, we don't really have one of those, so... Like a pure, like a Ginla-esque sniper. Yeah, well, I mean, that's Goudreau's role, but he's not turning on this year. Well, he's not really... Like, he's a good goal scorer, but he's not... Like, what I would envision as being a prolific scorer. You know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. him being more that cerebral... If the puck's there, I will, but if you know, the guy's open, I'll do that too. So I think that I mean? might change as he gets older too. True. I mean, if you look at a 22 year old Jerome McGinley, he wasn't like that. Yeah. We'll see. I, you could be right. I just think that Goudreau's game is going to evolve as he gets older. And I think for all these guys, that's why it's going to take some time to answer this question. Cause I mean, you know, Bennett's 20, uh, Monaghan's 21 and Goudreau's 22. I think it's just going to take some time to see really what we have in these guys. Well, that's why I'm hoping with the draft the Flames can get Owen Tippett because he's definitely one of those snipers. And he shoots right. 
and he's six foot two, so you know everything that the Flames need. Well, let's cross our fingers. But that would likely mean the Flames miss the playoffs and decently too. But but you know. Sunday, you gotta you gotta you know make a sacrifice to get something. Yep. And I mean the last great draft pick that we got on this team was Matthew Kachuk. Um, a player who I was still surprised was available when we went to draft, and he's having a heck of a year. And Matt, I wanted to get your thoughts. Um, what do you think Kachuk's likelihood would be to win Rookie of the Year, to win that Calder Trophy? Uh, if Warinsky, Austin Matthews, and Patrick Lane get hurt for the rest of the season, and Kachuk continues to do what he does, then yes. Otherwise, yeah, no. It's you got too many. It's a really good year for rookies, unfortunately. But see, when I I always look at the Calder Cup as which rookie has best influenced their team overall. And, and I, think I would you, still say Austin Matthews. I agree. I I think Austin Matthews done. Best, I'd even I think, say uh, Matt Murray in Pittsburgh might actually be ahead of Kachuk. Maybe I I you know I wouldn't give it to Lene because of that because his team is falling fast. Yeah, but and and I think that Austin. I think if we're talking about Austin Matthews playing for, let's say, the Oilers or a Western Conference team, I think it'd be a pretty even vote on that. But I think just the fact that Matthews in Toronto and the East generally tends to win these things on votes, I think that Austin Matthews is going to win it. Yeah, I think the three finalists will be uh, Matthews, Wierenski, and Murray. If Lene's concussion takes a while, if not, then switch Murray with Lene. You could be right. It's just I don't know. We've we are getting such a great season out of him. You really want him to get oh, acknowledged for that. Yeah, it's just one of those bad years where you've got too many good players, so not much you can do. Good for the league, not great for a team who wants to acknowledge their rookie. Yep. Well, let's uh, switch focus from the Calgary Flames a little bit and talk, which we haven't done in a while, about our farm teams and some of the young players in our system. The Stockton Heat. Neither of you have been watching. Neither of us have been watching the games a lot lately, but I've been following some of the box scores. This team's been doing pretty well since the start of the season. Um, they played their first game back after the new year on January 6th, which was heat cap giveaway night. I wish they did those kind of things here. And then the seventh back-to-back was foam puck night, and they won both of those. They had a bit of a break until the 11th, and then they played the 11th, the 13th, and the 14th quite quickly in succession and lost all three. And from what I saw, the team wasn't looking great. I'm wondering if this is just a fact of not playing enough in January because they've really only had five games since they came back and three very close, or what it is. But, I mean, the the Stockton Heat have looked pretty good for most of the year, and they're they're struggling this week. Yeah. It, uh, as we've been saying about Calgary, there's ebbs and flows with everything. And, and it's happening um, there as well. Yeah. It, I wouldn't read too much into it. Right now, the Stockton Heat's at fourth in the Pacific Division. I think it's top four from each division make the playoffs in the AHL. I'd have to double check. Um, but they're at 40 points. They're actually in a three-way tie for second with the Tucson Roadrunners, which is Phoenix's or Arizona's farm team, and the San Jose Barracuda, which is the San Jose Sharks farm team, and the Ontario Reign, which is LA's farm team, are number one in our division. So uh, we have the San Diego Gulls, the Texas Stars, the Bakersfield Condors, and the San Antonio Rampage below us. So still very respectable position here. And if we look at some of these young players... I'm surprised by some of the leaders on this team. Matt, you haven't looked at the list lately, I don't think. Who do you think is the number one uh, in terms of points for Stockton? Jankowski. Jankowski's tied with Lyndon Vay. Yeah, that makes sense. He's the veteran guy we didn't think would do a lot, and he's come through really well. Well, that's why you signed veteran AHL players, because they always tend to generate points, at least for your AHL team. Yeah, for sure. And you need them. I mean, we've seen that. It, whether it's points or even just veteran leadership, um, we definitely need that. The other guys that are, I'm surprised, um, Morgan Klimchuk's had a turnaround year. He's got 12 goals, 12 assists for 24 points, being third on the team. And on Andrew Mangiapane's at 22. And Matt Fratton, another sort of AHL veteran guy at 20. 
And the highest uh, defenseman right now is Rasmus Anderson, who has two goals and 16 assists for 18 points. So a lot of guys putting up good points. Emil Poirier's got 17. Brandon Boleg's got 14. Shin Carrick's got 13. You got to wonder how it feels for Shin Carrick to have Boleg have more points than you. Well, he's been in Calgary a bit, so that he probably doesn't have the games played. That's true. Yeah, he's got 18 games to Boleg's 26. But, yeah, I mean, good good. Good to see that. Daniel Preble's not doing too bad. So overall, the guys, I think what I'm trying to get across with this is the young players that we need to be performing are performing. Yeah. The only Someone player I'm... down here last year. The only player I'm disappointed in is Emil Poirier. I'm feeling that he's... His time in the organization may be drawing to a close because I think the Flames may just end up wanting to salvage some of the value that he has left. Because usually teams will pay like a third round pick for a first round draft pick. Yeah, you... I can I can see that happening. I could see us trading him almost like the uh, the Granlin deal. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. But I can also see the team trying to work with him to become a different type of player. I think that if they like him, and I mean he's the old regime's guy, which doesn't always mean anything, but um, if they like him, I could see working with him to be. He was always anticipated to be a top offensive forward and i could see working with him to be more of a michael backland type two-way forward yeah he just seems to have hit that wall offensively and hasn't really recovered since then so and maybe he's hit the highest he can get in the ahl like maybe we need to give him some time at the nhl to see what he can do can yeah. you see that sometimes where these guys just they've done everything they can at the a and they just need that new challenge I don't know a lot about Emil. I haven't talked to Emil much. I don't know what motivates him, but sometimes you just got to give those guys a call up. Well, it wouldn't hurt. Like, if he's still in the organization post-deadline, I think he'd be one of the first recalls just to give him an opportunity. Yeah, I agree with you, though, that I think he could be definitely a uh, an attractive piece to move at the deadline where you're not going to miss much. You know, you move a, a farm team guy, you could get return for him, whether it's another farm team guy or a fringe NHL or, or a pick, and you're not going to miss much off the main roster. A couple other players I want to talk about, guys not playing professionally, but some of our juniors. We've got a ton of guys playing junior this year um, all over the U.S. and Canada. That happens Some, when you have too many draft picks. That's true. Year. I mean, you know, it's weird because we say the cupboards were empty and now we've got so many prospects, it's hard to keep track of them all. Yeah, well, that's the reason why, like, I'm not opposed to selling at the deadline. Just keep getting more picks. All the draft picks from last year seem to be doing so well. So might as well And a lot of them going. really surprising. Like, we've done well with our mid to late round draft picks, it looks like. Yeah, well, look at Manjapani. In the yeah. AHL, for sure, yeah. I mean, Dylan Dubé playing for the Kelowna Rockets. He has 19 points in 14 games. Matthew Phillips, uh, 51 points in 43 games. He's tearing it up for Victoria. Uh, Itu Tutuola, 19 points in 30 games. He's looking really good. Adam Fox looks like a steal based on what we saw at the World Juniors. Uh, two goals and 17 assists for 19 points in 15 games. The NCAA is getting to be a tougher league to play in, and Fox is looking really good there. Yeah, he's the top freshman def defender, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Brett, Brett Pollock is still playing for the Adiron Adirondack Thunder of the ECHL. He's got 14 points in 31 games. Um, Kanzig's down there as well. I think Kanzig's going to be another bust on this team, um, sort of like I'd say maybe Poirier's turn out to be. But, you know, we've also got guys over in Europe who are doing really well. Pavel Karnikov is starting to turn things around. He's got 16 points in 19 games. And that's that's looking good for him. Adam Olis Matson always looks good. He doesn't have a lot of points. He's got two points in thirty three games, but Matson's not really a, a point getting defenseman. But if you look at his stats and his play, I've seen some clips. He's looking like he fits in well down there. Yeah, it, and it, it, you're gonna like uh, with both Kansig and Olis Matson, you're not expecting them to light the lamp no. any more than what Derek England would. So for sure. Like if I just they think make that if the you, NHL, they're going to be that t guy, basically. Yeah, I just think if you look at it, though, we have more promising can candidates oh, right now than definitely. Kanzig. But we need to keep trying to get that rugged defenseman in because the Flames don't have that. They have lots of 
Brody type prospects, but no like really imposing physical defensemen. So that's one thing that the Flames do need to address at some point, but But we've got time and you know yeah. we're not I don't think we're gonna look at any guy maybe outside of round one or two. Um, and yeah. well, you know, that's expect, why, like, expect uh, this guy to make the team. And even a guy like Shillington, you know, hasn't made the team yet. So I think we yeah. have a few years where we can find that player. Yeah. And that's why I think getting Carl Alsner would be like a good stopgap for that. And Alsner played here for the Hitmen, so he knows the city well. Yeah. So we'll see. But you know what I mean? Like, they have to address that, whether it's through trade free agent or drafting, one of the three. Yeah. I but, just don't know that it has to be addressed this year. No. But you never know. It's I mean, if the right things. opportunity... Like if it, yeah, if it comes up, then sure. You definitely you know. take it. We've always said that. But I don't think you need to go out and, you know, make it your quest to find that guy in this offseason. No. It's always, like, the last thing on the list. Mm -hmm. um, any other Flames topics you want to talk about? I'm good. Well, why don't we get into our predictions, then? We've got a, a, game, a week of all home games. If you want to go to any of these games, hit up our friends at Tick Ticks on your Android or iOS device and grab some tickets. The Dome's getting fun again. I've been to the Dome recently, and it's it's going to be a good time again. Everyone's getting back into it and enjoying the Flames games, so definitely go check these out if you can. Last week, Matt and I didn't do very well. We had six points on the table, and we ended up getting three of them, so four games. We got three points. We ended up getting, obviously, a, um, a win against the San Jose Sharks. We got a loss against the Devils, and we ended up getting the one point in the shootout against Edmonton. So we split the difference on that, Matt. I'm still up 5-1 to one here. This week, we've got four games. Three of them are at home. And the first one of the week is tomorrow night on Tuesday against your second favorite NHL team, the Florida Panthers. The next one is on Thursday against the Nashville Predators. And then we complete the homestand on Saturday, again, taking on the Oilers. And then Monday is the start of a back-to-back -back against Toronto, and we'll be broadcasting after that game. So four games on the table. Any thoughts? Four points. You think we sweep? No, four points. Oh, not okay. Eight. Four. Sorry, which four? Uh, Florida and Toronto. That would be the obvious choices. Florida's struggling. Um, Toronto's on a bit of an upswing. Yeah. But it, it was like a toss-up for me between Nashville and Toronto. But I think the Flames are going to lose to the Oilers again. So. I, I, I think it'd be funny if Toronto comes in and plays Michael Haney. <laughs> yeah, true. Well, he They've actually been... played well that game against Ottawa. Yeah, but you can get one or two good ones out of Michael Haney. Yeah. And then six goals against, and yeah, we're not playing you again for a long time. <laughs> so That's what you get out of Tabasco, though. Yep. I'm going to be a little more optimistic than you. I think we beat Florida. I don't think we beat them by much, but I think we beat them. I think we lose to Nashville, and I think we'll beat Edmonton and Toronto. Okay. Works for me. I'm uh, yeah. I'm just looking at the rest of the schedule. I think that they're going to beat Toronto. I think we'll talk about next week after that. I think they lose to Montreal, and Ottawa's kind of a toss up. But yeah, I think I just think that the team is. If you look at the way they've been playing lately, they need a win, and you know they need a good win after this after the last two games. I think that they're going to bring some of their frustration from Edmonton against Florida. I think they can beat Florida. I think Nashville deflates us, and I think you're going to see this team play crazy hockey on the 21st against Edmonton because they have to. I mean, you can't drop four games in a row at Edmonton. And that is the last time we play them this season, barring it is, playoffs. It's at home. Yeah, so we'll see. I'm not optimistic against Edmonton. Like, we held them at bay, but I'm not sure that you can contain McDavid again. I think you finally put Johnson in net against the Oilers. Eh, Elliot did good. Uh, we'll see. But they've see. solved Elliot. Yeah. We'll see. Right, well, it, it largely depends on the next two games. Like whichever goalie plays and plays well, throw them in the, against Edmonton, whoever that is. And then the Flames are coming up on a bit of a break later this month. On the 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st, they have a break. And we have All-Star festivities, I believe, in there as well, which helps facilitate some of that break. Uh, speaking of All-Star, we should actually announce before we left, um, the Flames All-Star representative in the AHL is Mark Jankowski. 
So nice to see the rookie getting the call in the AHL. Matt, enjoy this week for the Flames. Enjoy the Florida game. I know you like that team, and uh, hopefully they don't beat us. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week. We'll talk to you next week. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.